I'm going to introduce the oriented bounding box in this episode, which is a rectangle that is able to rotate. For the collision detection, I will use a method that is common for 2D convex polygons, and it's called separating axis theorem. I think the simplest example to explain the separating axis theorem is having two line segments perpendicular to each other, both parallel to one of the axes in the coordinate system, like I have these two here. And what I do is I get an axis that is perpendicular to one of them, and I project the line segment's endpoints on that axis. And I do the same with the other line segment, and I will be able to tell if the two line segments are intersecting just by looking at the position of the projections. If the projection of one line segment's endpoints is between the projections of the other line segment's endpoints, and that's true for both of the line segments, then they are intersecting. Here it's not the case because the green projection is in between the red ones, but the red one on the other axis is not between the green ones. And that's how I can tell from the projections that the two line segments are not intersecting. And this here is another example. The projection perpendicular to the green line has the green point in between the red ones. The red line's projection has the red point in between the green ones. So this time the line segments are intersecting. Most of the time this method is used for convex polygons and not line segments. The simplest case for that is having two rectangles. These have four edges, but since they are perpendicular to each other, I only need two projection axes for each instead of four, which means two times two axes altogether, and they will look something like this. If I start going along one axis in one direction and I reach the last green earlier than the first red one, or the last red one earlier than the first green one, then the rectangles are not colliding along that axis. And if they don't collide along one axis, that means that they don't collide at all. In that case, I found a separating axis. And if I find an axis like that, then I don't need to keep trying with the other axis to know if the collision detection is true or false, because it is only true if this doesn't happen on any of the axes. If I connect the two projections with the same color that are the furthest away from each other along one axis, then the two line segments I get need to overlap along every axis for the collision detection to return true. In the code, first I'm going to implement the version with the two line segments. So I delete the two capsules and create two walls instead. And I comment out the iterations in the main loop. The shortcut for that in Visual Studio is Control K C. Then I call the walls draw method in the main loop and I'm going to create a function called SAT that calls these two wall objects and I display collision on the canvas if this function returns true. I will put that message to the 500-400 position and I don't need that line either here. And what I do next is I create an empty function called SAT which will take two objects as arguments. They don't need to be walls but they will be for now. And then I can check the canvas. I don't need this here either. Anyway, I can check the canvas and I can see the two walls. So the code is working, but nothing's happening yet. And before I start working on the separating axis theorem, first I want to rename the draw wall method of the wall class to draw because that's simpler. And also up here, the wall class will get an array called vertex. The vertex, by definition, is the common endpoint of two or more rays or line segments. This time for the wall class, it will store the starting point and the end point. And once I've done that, I go down back to the SAT function, which is now empty. The first thing I do is I collect all the axes I will project the vertices onto. In the case of two line segments, these are the two perpendicular lines on them, and I only need the direction of those axes, so they will be unit vectors. Then second, I will write a function that projects all the vertices of an object onto an axis and returns the two that are the furthest away from each other along the axis. Those will be the min and the max values of one object along one axis. 
And if I do that for both objects along the same axis, then I can check if the two min-max intervals are overlapping, and if they don't, that means that there is a separating axis that goes through between the two objects, which means that the objects cannot overlap, and the SAT function immediately returns false. And I can copy it and check it for the other axis, and if it still hasn't returned false after all those checks, then it can return true, meaning that the two objects are intersecting. And then I can start writing the function that picks the minimal and maximal projections. It's the projection of a shape onto an axis. And to project a vertex along an axis, I will take the dot product of the vector pointing to the vertex from the origin and the unit vector of the axis. The larger the result's absolute value is, the further away the projection is along that axis. The function picks the furthest and the closest ones along the axis. One of those will be the minimum and one of them will be the maximum, depending if they are positive or negative values. This function iterates through the vertices of the object along one axis and keeps track of the minimal and the maximal projection values, and then it returns with that min-max pair, which makes it easier to check the overlaps between two objects' projections along one axis. And that's how I would implement the separating axis theorem on two line segments. I don't need to declare the overlap variable again. And I check the canvas, I see the two line segments, and I make one of them longer so that they actually intersect. 330, and here they intersect, and I do see the collision message here. Then I change them a little bit, both of them, like this. I can still see the collision message, and I can still see that they are colliding. And let's make one of them shorter. 200, 200. And now I don't see again. It definitely seems to be working. And now it's time to take a step forward and introduce the box class. I go up and I will place the box class after the capsule class. And this will be a rectangle that can rotate. The way the rectangle is instantiated is that first it gets two xy coordinates, those will be the first two vertices, and the line connecting them will be the edge, and the magnitude of the edge will be the length of the box, and the direction of the edge will be the direction property. Then another argument of the box object is the width, that's how far the third vertex is from the second one in the clockwise direction. Since the normal method of the vector class I'm using returns with a perpendicular direction clockwise. And the last vertex distance from the third one is again the length value. And again it's in the clockwise perpendicular direction. So far I defined the four vertices of the rectangle and the length and the width. Plus the direction that will keep changing and the reference direction as a reference for the rotation matrix. And I can just copy the rest of the properties from the capsule class, starting with the inertia, I guess? No, starting with the mass. And I have to modify this a little bit. I already defined the length, and instead of the r, I will use the width. And by the way, I have to go back to the capsule because in the inertia, here I need two times the r and not one time to get the width of the capsule. And also I don't need the reference direction. And about the position, that should be the center of the box. That's the point that's in the same distance from all the four vertices. So I go from the first vertex to one direction by half of the length and to the perpendicular direction by half of the width, and that's how I reach the central point of the rectangle. And another thing I can delete is the reference angle, 
which I only needed for the capsule for the visual representation. It didn't really have any physical relevance. And after I delete that, I have all the properties I need and I create the three empty methods that I always have in the these shape classes, the draw, the key control and the reposition methods. They all start as an empty method. And the draw method is quite easy actually. It's just simply connecting the four vertices with four lines. And as an extra, I put a test circle in the position property to be sure that it's where it needs to be in the middle of the rectangle. This test circle is a function that I still need to define. So uh, before I do that, I delete the dir property that I copied from the capsule to avoid having a duplication. I already have a dir here. And the test circle, I will put it here. It will take an X and a Y value as arguments and an optional argument for the drawing color, which is set to black as default. And it will draw a circle with the radius of 10 around the X, Y point. And after finishing this function, I should be able to see the box object on the canvas. And here it is. This is the circle around the central point. And before I go back to the separating axis theorem, I want to implement the key control and the reposition methods of the box class. And those are very similar to the ones I implemented in the capsule class. So I take the key control method and I can just copy to the box class. And I don't have to modify it. the up and down keys, change the linear acceleration and the left and right keys change the angular velocity and I also copy the reposition method from the capsule class and that will be also really similar. I find the new position value based on the linear velocity and I find the new direction unit vector based on the current angle and the rotation matrix. The only difference is that instead of finding the start and the end points I will need the positions of the four vertices and I can set the four vertices based on the position, the direction and the box dimensions. If I go from the position point towards the direction by half of the box length and then towards the directions normal by half of the box width, then I will end up at one of the vertices. I only need to decide if I go to the positive or to the negative direction along the direction unit vector and it's normal. And if I want to check if it's working, then I need to call the key control and the reposition methods in the main loop. And after calling this, I should be able to move the box on the canvas and it is moving in a similar way as the capsule did, which is not really a surprise. Next, I instantiate a new box object and I call its draw method in the main loop. Then it will look like this. And to apply the separating axis theorem on rectangles instead of line segments, the only thing I need to change is the axis I want the shapes to be projected onto. The axis variables will be arrays this time, storing two perpendicular direction vectors for each box. And then the test needs to go through every axis. And for that I will use for loops. So all I change now is checking four axes altogether instead of just two. And then I can call the SAT function for the two box objects and see if I have the message yeah, the collision message, it's there if they are colliding and it's not there if they are not colliding. So the separating axis theorem has been applied to two rotating rectangles, which was the purpose of this episode. And I'm going to keep working with the separating axis theorem because I also want to 
use it for the collision response and the penetration resolution. And I will show how to do that in the next episode.